Maximize Your Influence is your podcast for the latest persuasion, sales, and negotiation techniques. Our mission is to help you influence on command, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Your host is the author of Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma, and the best-selling book, Maximum Influence. Now, your host, Kurt Mortensen. Hope everyone's feeling good. Welcome back, Maximizers. This is Maximize Your Influence. Kurt Mortensen here, Podcast 473. You're making it happen. You're achieving your goals. As we talked about how to maximize your influence. Things you should have learned in school. We're going to talk about them today. Questions, comments, rude remarks. We take those at Kurt, K-O-R-T, at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. Or go to the website, MaximizeYourInfluence.com. For your free Persuasion IQ assessment. In fact, we're expanding that to include the Charisma IQ assessment. Stay tuned. I'll keep you posted. I was in a, a Dallas, Texas this week. A cool 109 degrees with that humidity. <laughs> wow, off the charts, very hot. And if you're used to a drier climate, you just don't get used to it. Especially if you go jogging or something like that, you just like sweat for the next three days. But anyway, had good barbecue, had a lot of fun, very hot. Shout out to my peeps in Dallas. So on this trip, I encountered the Persuasion Ninja. This was the bus driver at the airport that loved their job. Now, I'm not saying that's the funnest, most favorite job in the world, but at least they were having fun. They were smiling. They were helping. They were complimenting. Number one, not only did that increase their tips, but it made everyone's life a little more enjoyable. And we've met plenty of people, whether it be fast food, dishwashers, I don't know, fill in the blank. I've had a lot of those jobs and it's easy to hate the job. I think the worst one I had was cleaning stores from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I had to make sure all the floors were shiny clean. <laughs> I tried to have fun. That one was difficult, but this bus driver loved their job. They had interesting facts. They were helping people out. They were smiling and it was very contagious. I mean, that's a ninja. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it in a fun, exciting, passionate way. There's something about your job you can find passionate, whether it's the people, being able to serve others. I mean, a lot of things that you can find. Again, you might as well enjoy it. There's plenty of bitter people out there, especially now. You know, always canceling, always offended, always bitter. We don't need another Aunt Edna. Remember, we've talked about Aunt Edna. She's the aunt in your family that you sit next to at a family gathering, not even talk to her, and she sucks the life out of you. We've got plenty of those. There's already enough negative things in the world. We want some optimistic people. It's no secret that optimistic people live longer, are better persuaders, are more charismatic, have more friends, make more money. Hey, if it's a challenge for you, go check out Learned Optimism by Dr. Seligman. He'll put you on the right course. I think part of that too is in sales, we call it being a product of the product. You actually believe in what you're doing. You're using it. If you're not using it, maybe it's software for doctors. Maybe you're not a doctor, but you believe in it. There's success stories. You see the lives that it's changing. That's what we're looking for. So be genuine, being real, be a product of the product. Be the change that you're asking other people to do. All very important. Versus the blunder side of that. Don't, don't, don't. I'll call her the angry ranger. <laughs> I mentioned a few weeks ago that I went out to the wilderness and there was a ranger there. And of course, kids out in the wilderness, throwing rocks, doing dumb stuff. Man, she went off. How can you do it? National parks, you can't throw a rock. It took 10,000 years for it to get there. It's going to destroy the ecosystem. Basically, her tone was, you're too dumb to understand. Well, now, there's probably some truth to that. But being the angry ranger, having that angry passion... Treating people like they're too dumb to understand is kind of the opposite. And when she was not around, they were throwing rocks again. So angry passion has a temporary effect. True passion, loving what you do, has long-term effects. So there you have it, a little ninja and a blunder. So before we get into how do you persuade, influence, sell different personality styles... Let's talk about the geeky, scholarly article. It's called The Psychological Study of Smiling, brought to you by psychologicalscience.org, Eric Jaff, Neuropsychology and Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. So they go deep and say, hey, your zygomatic major, 
which resides in your cheek, tugs your lips upward, and that encircles the eye socket, squeezes of the outside corners of your eyes into those crow's feet. That's how you know it's a real smile. It's short. It can last one to two, three seconds. That's when you know it's a real smile. But then they go on to say other muscles can simulate a smile. But we're looking for that true connecting smile, known as the Duchesne smile, which is a true indicator of enjoyment, a genuine expression of positive emotion. And the Duchesne smile comes from a Dr. Duchesne who was in France who was stimulating facial muscles with electrical currents. You know, what is it with doctors, psychologists, and electrical currents? But that's how they were figuring this out. So he goes on to say the intensity of a true grin, a smile can predict marital happiness, personal well-being, even longevity. And we know those fake smiles, but sometimes that fake smile comes when we're embarrassed. Maybe we're trying to deceive somebody. Maybe it's grief. And this can depend on age, gender, culture, and social setting. So it's different. This goes back to Paul Ekman's study. We've talked about him on the show. He does the FACS, the Facial Action Coding System where he took a deep dive in every muscle of the face and what emotions were being triggered. If you want to check that out, it's pretty intense, pretty deep. It was also what the show Lied to Me was about, if you saw that one, being able to read deception and emotions. In fact, Dr. Ekman did a study, if I recall, that uh, they were attaching, again, more electrodes to the heads of participants, and they saw either one of two films. One to produce a positive emotion. It was just animals in the forest. And then the negative one... It was a nurse training video with amputated legs and severe burns. Not fun stuff to look at. So the true smile, the Duchesne smile, produced greater activity in the brain's left anterior temporal region, if you need to know. And it taught them not to lump all smiles as a smile. You're looking for that Duchesne smile. The lips are going up. The eyes are smiling with the mouth. That is the key. Another interesting one. This was done at Wayne State University. They looked at professional baseball players from a 1952 yearbook, right? We're going back. And then they looked at when they died, when they passed away. <laughs> they found, believe it or not, that a smile, a true smile from the 1952 yearbook explained a 35% difference in survival. So you live longer when you can truly smile because it's a genuine expression of happiness. Happy, optimistic people do live longer. That is a fact. Even Dr. Bernardo found that smiling through tough times does a body good, that people showed lower levels of distress, and helps the body. What I'm getting out of this is even a smile, which is not as good as a laugh, is better than a frown or negativity. Another interesting one at 10 months, a baby, an infant, will offer a false smile to an approaching stranger while reserving the genuine Duchesne smile for the parents. So those cheesy, cheap, fake Creeper, creeper, tin grins, got to be careful of, but a good grin's very contagious. It's better for your health. It connects you with people. And in retail, smiles increase sales 20% and customer service over the phone. There's a better connection. So get a better smile. Get a real Duchesne smile. So let's go to listener email. Oh boy. This is Frank from Munich, Germany. Kurt, you dealt with How to deal with different generations on a podcast. I want to know how to deal with the different personality styles. All right, Frank, you get the free version of InfluenceUniversity.com, the gold version. And this is open to anybody who wants to send me something I use on the podcast. Check out our products and services and all the links from today's show at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. Obviously, you can recommend the podcast to your family, friends, and enemies. Give us some reviews under Maximize Your Influence for Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and iHeartRadio. There you go for your plug. So there's a lot of different assessments out there. Some take a huge deep dive and go to 30 different types of personalities. That tends to make most people's brains explode. Most people do four. Sometimes I'll start people off with just two things to look for. Are we connecting? Are we building trust? Are they a detail person? Are they a vision person? So let's take a big picture look at some of these. In fact, I'll tackle these over the next four weeks as we work through this. But there's a lot of different styles. So let's tackle what we call in the color code a white personality in the DISC assessment, conscientiousness, but also known as an owl, systematic, philosopher, analyzer. 
This is your very hardcore, analytical, hard to read, poker face type person. They're deep and thoughtful. They geek out on graph charts and details. They're very cautious when making decisions because their fear is being wrong. They love organization and structure. They ask a lot of questions, which can drive a lot of people nuts, but they want to be right. They're going to ask a lot of questions. They work slow. They like to work alone for the most part. And when you understand these, there's no right or wrong, and this is you most of the time. So again, not a lot of emotions. That could be a lot of hugging and touching. And your opinions will drive them nuts. They want the facts. So this white philosopher, conscientiousness, systematic type personality, you have to understand to them results are more important than the relationship. That's just how they're programmed. The details are more important than the vision. So when someone has this big vision, the CEO, they're like, how are we going to get there? So if you're going to build a team, you actually want every one of these four personalities in your team. They all bring different strengths to the team. So don't waste their time. Get to the point quickly. Don't need to sugarcoat it. Be formal and be prepared. Know your numbers. Don't say, oh, it's about $1,000. <laughs> no. September is $1,172.63. In November, it's, I think you get the drill here. You just wind them up, give them a sense of the direction where they need to go. Do not micromanage. No gushy chit chat. Don't need to do the pop in. Just do an email or a text. Focus on the facts, very low emotion. The challenge a lot of time is you need to give them clear deadlines because if there's no deadlines, it's not going to get done. There's going to be some analysis paralysis. They want to get it right. You need to have that clear deadline. That can drive them crazy. When you surprise them with something, you change a deadline, this is going to drive them crazy. They're not mentally prepared for that. And you might even want to give them permission to fail. What I mean by that, if you need it done in two weeks, just say, look, I don't expect perfection. You might get it wrong the first couple of times. That's okay. We just have to get something done. Might be something you can do. You might even offer a promise or a guarantee. I mean, look, I'm the manager. If it doesn't work out, I'll take the blame. So if you can make a personal promise or guarantee that it's going to work out, or if it's not going to work out, you'll take the blame. That can ease it up a little bit. But I can't reiterate enough, be prepared. Know your numbers. Know the exact numbers. Don't waste any time. Don't surprise them. Stick to your deadline. Stick to what you're asking. And you've got to come in and show them, okay, here's the vision, but here's the details. This is how we're going to get here. Here are the steps. That is key. That gray area can drive them crazy. I look at my public speaking courses and, you know, I'll get an accountant, an engineer, obviously one of these analytical personalities. There's one right answer. And we get into the soft skills, emotional intelligence, public speaking, persuasion. There's some adapting. There's not always one right answer. So I'll give them a formula on, okay, this is what a persuasive presentation looks like. And they'll follow it. And in my courses, I have the audience do the grading, right? Half the grade comes from the audience and they're bewildered why the audience slammed them and didn't give a good grade. And well, that's not fair. They follow the formula. Well, the formula is a small piece of that. They love the formulas. They love the systems, but adding the soft skills can sometimes be a challenge. Well, you know, that is the formula, but you should smile. You shouldn't fold your arms. You should be more warm in your presentation. But that's who they are. And a lot of times, work's work, home's home. We're not going to go out and hang out. I don't need to get to know you. I'll get my job done. Again, let them run. Don't micromanage. That can be something to think about. You can watch those gray areas. They like the black and white. And if it's gray, try to bring in some studies. Try to bring in some surveys or polls. And that's good for anybody, but especially this type of personality is to use social validation to sway, persuade, to change their mind. And that's why I mentioned an internal poll, a survey, other departments that have implemented, four to five dentists recommend, 5,000 four and a half star reviews on Amazon. How can you provide social validation to other people doing it? And sometimes you'll need to prove your worth. They want to work with experts, and so you need to be able to work with them. One thing I'd recommend, we've talked about this before on the podcast, is come prepared. We talked about that. But what can you teach them to do? If you want to be accepted as the expert, that subject matter expert, to have that credibility, can you teach them something new in the first four minutes? That seems to be the magical number. Whether it be a presentation or one-on-one, 
What can you do in the first four minutes? Something new, unique, different, a different angle, different insight, different thought. What can you do to prove your worth? Again, insight study, something. Something that they hadn't thought about, something to prove your worth. Once you're in, proved your worth, you're the expert, there's very little resistance. And that's true across the board. When people accept you as the expert, there's very little persuasion resistance. So if you're looking to sell and persuade this personality, be exact. Crank down the optimism and energy a little bit. (laughs) And we want to be optimistic, but this is the style, the personality that wants to hit you for being too optimistic. Now, you can have realistic optimism. And the difference is the optimism where we want to hit you is everything's great. The world's great. Everything's perfect. You're like, no, it's not. No, we've got inflation. We've got this. We've got wars. Most people, especially this style, wants realistic optimism. Tone it down a bit. That means we're going to get there, but we're going to hit some potholes, probably take the wrong road a few times, hit a few trees, but we're going to get there. That's the type of optimism they're looking for. So what you want to do is Monday morning and they haven't had their coffee and you're like, it's a great day. Or you call the depression hotline. It's a great day at the depression hotline. I know that's a bad example, but you feel the disconnect. So you want to mirror their energy and bring them up a little bit. But if you're coming in at 10 out of 10 and they're at a two, there's going to be a disconnect there. Because some people in sales and persuasion said, got to have energy, you got to have enthusiasm. No, not for everyone. Not for this style, not for this personality. So to review, to them, results first in the relationship, details first before the vision. They tend to go slower, send out the longer emails. Again, don't micromanage, be prepared, have the exact numbers. Focus on the facts, not the emotions. Focus on the effects, not your opinions. Crank down the enthusiasm. Careful the gray. Try to define the gray if you need to. Use social validation to show them that other people have used it and implementing it changes. It works. Give them permission to fail that you don't expect perfection. If it's appropriate to say, look, if it doesn't work out, I'll take the blame. That's what you're looking for. Now, one final one I want to add to, and this is true across the board, but especially to this systematic brain. Okay, Our brains are wired differently. This is the analytical systematic brain is it's easier to persuade them using the foot in the door technique. Meaning, it's easier to persuade them a little bit at a time than a lot bit at a time. (laughs) I'll put it to you that way. Even for lawyers, for the jury, just let the jury discover a little bit at a time is more persuasive than all at once, the data dump, the vomit. And this allows this type of personality to figure it out on their own. They're making the decision. They're persuading themselves. They're coming up with a solution. You're just planting a little seed at the time, getting a little yes at the time, getting a little Maybe. Is it possible? Could it? Let's do some research. Let's see. Because that's what foot in the door does. It's just easier to persuade somebody in three or four meetings than one big meeting. I know you want to be one and done, but it's easier in three or four meetings. Instead of one big question, maybe three or four smaller questions that trigger the yes. Remember the study of the psychology students that were asked to do a sensory perception study early on Saturday morning and it's like six or seven in the morning. 24% said yes. It doubled when they used foot in the door where they said, hey, will you participate? Well, yeah. Saturday available? Yeah. Can you be there in the morning? Yeah. So it went up to 56%. It more than doubled. All they did was take one big ass into smaller yeses. Same thing's true with meetings, getting people to change their mind, to think their opinion. Otherwise, you'll get that boomerang effect that you get at family gatherings where two people are trying to prove each other wrong about politics or COVID or whatever it is. But the more they hold on, the more they grasp on, the more they try to change their mind, they hold on tighter. And they're not going to change their mind. So that's why we just nudge a little bit, push a little bit, get a little yes here. Is that possible? And maybe here that could be can make a big difference in the persuasion process. Foot in the door could also be, hey, can I get five minutes of your time versus can I get two hours of your time? Just simple yeses, simple things to think about. Maybe let's look at it. Let's see is always more persuasive for everybody, but especially this white conscientious philosopher type personality. So there you have it. Next time we'll go into the red, driving, assertive, in-your-face type, tenacious personality. But we have this one applied this week. Use it. Take a look at it. So be aware of reading the person. It gets quicker and faster. In fact, a lot of companies are actually posting on their doors what personality they are. How refreshing is that? And let people know there's no right or wrong. This is just you most of the time at work. And it's important to adapt to those personalities. So, hey, check us out, MaximizeYourInfluence.com. The special of the week, of course, is free. Take your presentation IQ. Help me out with a little research. It's just 10 questions. Take a few minutes, and I'll give you the webinar on how to create structure and deliver that perfect, persuasive, charismatic presentation. 
You get the templates, the downloads, everything you need. Just take the 10 questions. It's good for you, too, to see where you rank. Because anybody can present, but are you persuasive? Anybody can inform, but are you influential? Check it out, presentationiq.com. Link's also at maximizeyourinfluence.com. Thanks for being here. Again, tell your family, friends, and enemies about the podcast. Take something you learn. Become a better person. Improve your relationships. Become a better negotiator. Be a charismatic leader. And just go out and persuade with power. 